Puts it up. Bang! Durant! The lead! Tie game with five seconds remaining! Defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? Oh! Iguodala to Curry. Back to Iguodala. Up for the layup. Oh, blocked by James! They do have a timeout. Decide not to use it. Curry, way downtown. Bang! All right, what is going on, everybody? How is everybody doing today? Happy Wednesday, everyone. And we are back here today with another Just Ball and Podcast episode. And the topic of today's pod is going to be talking about disappointing players this season. So I know you may get a player mentioned on your favorite team, or maybe they're one of your favorite players in the league. So let me preface by saying this. Most of these guys had somewhat expectations this year and didn't reach it. Mostly everybody here is a good player. Now, there's some bad players on this list this season, but mostly everybody is at least still a good player. But the reason why a good player may be on this list is because I thought they could have taken a jump this year. I thought they could have elevated themselves into another tier and taken a leap, but they've kind of maybe just stayed where they were as a good player, as a fine player, but maybe they could have came a really, really good player or an elite player this season. So I just wanted to talk about that before we got into this because I didn't want to obviously upset anybody if there's one of your favorite players mentioned here. And there's a reason behind it. And some players, it's with injuries as well and something they can't control, but it's still a disappointing season nonetheless. Um, I am going to be doing one for every team, like my most disappointing player for every team video on the Strauss channel. So this is kind of like a sneak peek and a rough draft of that going into it. Just taking, I think, my 10 most this season and some in my, that I, it's a subjective list. Like, I don't think like these are the 10 most disappointing players. I think it's just my 10 most because for some of these guys, I expected a lot this year because there's even a rookie on this list as well um, that we'll get into in a little bit. So if you guys do enjoy these pods, on YouTube, I would appreciate you dropping a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button if you're not already, and if you were listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, uh, a rating review is like huge support, or if you end up, um, a rating review is a huge support, or if you wanna drop um, a follow as well, that would be very much appreciated. So I guess quickly before we, I'm actually gonna give my March Madness Sweet 16 picks at the end, um, so if you wanna just kind of focus on that, um, or just be part of that, you could stay until the end of this pod. So we could just start off with our first player, um, I think it's the most obvious, most disappointing player this year. He was traded last offseason, 23-year-old going into his age 24 season, um, coming off a title win in 2022, where he was a very important player, got the bag that offseason, could not have played better at a more perfect time. Um, it's Jordan Poole. Um, Jordan Poole this year got traded from the Golden State Warriors to the Washington Wizards in the Chris Paul trade. That happened um, on July 6th. And it was definitely a shocker to see the Warriors go after Chris Paul when they have somebody like Steph Curry on the team, when they have Klay Thompson. Jordan Poole, you could say, had a down year from 22 to 23 because the Warriors did lose in round two. Uh, The efficiency went down. um, Field goal percentage went down. Three-point percentage went down. Free throw percentage went down, um, even though the points per game went up. So it was somewhat of a down season, but still a fine season for Jordan Poole. I don't think he was a bad player by any means in 2023. But this year, in 2024, He's been disappointing. And I know the Wizards, and we know or knew going into this year, they were not going to be a good team. They were going to be one of the worst teams in the Eastern Conference. They moved Bradley Beal. They moved Chris Porzingis. They made him move Daniel Gafford at the trade deadline. Um, this team was really a, a rebuilding team. We wanted to see a lot out of Bilal Koulibaly. We wanted to see a lot of Denny of Diha. Um, we wanted to see just what Jordan Poole could do as a number one option on this team. And I'm going to give Jordan Poole some credit. Over his last 20-ish games, he's been pretty good. 20 points a night, five assists, 37% 37% from three, 90% from the line, 43 from the field. Like those aren't terrible numbers. The turnovers are there. The defense is still not great at all. But yeah, the first like 70% of the season was not great for Jordan Poole. And like I said, the last 20 games have been good for him. And if he can finish the season strong and he can finish like the last 30 games looking somewhat positive to have a career 180 in 2025 in his age 25 season, like that's amazing. We would love to see that. I'm sure Washington would love to see that as well due to his very large contract of him making 27 million this year, 29 million in 2025, 31 million in 26, and then 34 million in 2027. So yeah, I'm sure Washington is like begging for Jordan Poole to be good next year. Um, But we can kind of maybe chalk it up that this team was a mess overall. They fired Wes Unseld. Maybe him and Kuzma should not be the one and two next year. And I think you're stuck with Jordan Poole, at least for the time being, unless he, like I said, pulls a 180 next year and then you could trade him. I think if you're Washington, you probably look to move Kyle Kuzma and you have Jordan Poole become still that's like 
it's probably still that primary shot creator next year, but you're surrounding him with at least maybe another veteran or maybe some other guys that are more defensive oriented or pass first oriented. Like Ty Jones, I think they should resign. I love the development of Denny Dia this year. I love Bilal Koulibaly's rookie season. They're going to have another first or two round picks. Um, and obviously they're going to have a top five-ish pick as well. Um, they're going to have some cap space they can work with. Um, Corey Kisper hopefully could still stay solid for them and Johnny Davis uh, is probably done there but yeah Jordan Poole has been disappointing this year um, and I think for him just kind of looking like like at this value this year I thought maybe he could lead like I think people threw out the dark horse bets of him leading the league in points per game because he averaged 20 last year on a team with Steph Curry and Andrew Wiggins and Clay Thompson and this year we thought like number one spot in Washington and his field goal attempts have gone down he took 15 and a half shots a game last year and he's taking 14 and a half this year i mean he's shooting 40 percent from the field 32 percent from three he's still a good free throw shooter at 87 percent um the playmaking kind of went down in washington as well and you'd think with a higher volume he could have gone up uh he's gone from four and a half assists last year to 3.9 this year the usage rate from last year was at 29 percent it's dropped this year to 26 percent so we thought like jordan Poole was gonna have a larger role a uh, larger like i guess market share of that offense and was gonna be like that maybe primary playmaker like we could have seen them move on from Tyus Jones and he could have been a point guard at some point throughout this year but that has not really been the case um and it's definitely been a very disappointing year for Jordan Poole and I'm sure Wizards fans after moving on from Bradley Beal were just kind of hoping that he could be something for them uh he played around 75 percent of his minutes at shooting guard this year um around 20 percent of his minutes at point guard and then around like five ish percent of his minutes as a small forward and I think Jordan Poole gives me optimism. I think there's still optimism for Jordan Poole. Like, I'm not totally out on it. Like I said, horrible situation. I think they just got to ace the head coach. I would trade Kyle Kuzma in the offseason. And then even if he comes off the bench, like, yes, you're overpaying for a six-man, 100% to come off the bench. But in a maybe more lesser role with, like, that second unit that he can run it, he could still play, like, around 30 minutes a night, that may be a perfect spot for him next year. So, yeah, Jordan Poole is my most disappointing, probably my most disappointing player this year. Um, this isn't a ranking or a list or anything. It's just 10 guys. But I think he would come in number one for me if I were to rank them. So, yeah, Jordan Poole is the first guy I wanted to talk about. Next up, I wanted to talk about Mikel Bridges of the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, um, Mikel Bridges, if you went to any sports book preseason the most bet on and i think highest odds or i guess lowest odds um well i guess the favorite odds to win most improved player was mikel bridges people thought that with the sample size last year we saw in 27 games where he averaged 26 points four and a half rebounds three assists a night on really good efficiency for brooklyn as the number one post the Kevin Durant trade, we thought we were going to see those same numbers replicated this year and he could end up winning most improved. Well, kind of like Jordan Poole, the numbers have kind of gotten down this year from at least that 27 game sample size that we saw in Brooklyn. Obviously, those numbers were going to go up from Phoenix. He was playing with Chris Paul um, behind Devin Booker and DeAndre Aiden there, and he's going to come over to Brooklyn that no longer had Harden, no longer had Kyrie Irving, and it was Mikel Bridges' team, which ended up being still a thing this year. And you could obviously have a bunch of nets. Um, I only have one net here, but you could have Ben Simmons with the injuries. You could have Nick Claxton maybe overall as well uh, for Nets fans. Dorian Finney Smith, Cam Johnson could definitely make this this list as well Spencer Dinwiddie before he got shipped out so the Nets this year everybody's been kind of disappointing Jock Vaughn before he got fired um ton of guys been disappointing but yeah Mikel Bridges this year still an Iron Man like he's always been 72 games um he's taken 16 shots a night down from 18 and a half from that 27 game sample size with the Nets last year he's gone from 47 percent in that sample size to 43 percent 37 from three last year to 36 percent from three this year 89 percent from the line to 81% from the line this year. His three-point shot has gone down. He's still a very good defender, don't get me wrong. And I, I think I really like about Mikel Bridges' game is he doesn't complain. There is plays that could be called a foul, maybe shouldn't even be called fouls. And you look at him and he just gets right back, at least when I watch him, he gets right back on defense. He hustles back. He doesn't complain. Now, I'm going to throw guys like Luca or even my favorite player, Jay, or my favorite player, that's on my favorite team, not my favorite player in the league, but Jalen Brunson, 
he complains a ton as well. If it doesn't go his way, he complains. I will say that 100%. Um, but Mikel Bridges, I, I at least give him the credit that he plays hard and he doesn't complain. Um, and maybe that loses out on a couple free throws. Like he, he went from six and a half free throw attempts in that 27 game uh, sample size last year to four and a half free throw attempts a game. And we thought he could lead this Brooklyn Nets team to being one of the better teams, um, at least in the middle of the pack in the Eastern Conference. I know people were higher on them to maybe make the playoffs than like a team like Orlando or Indiana was. I didn't think that they were going to be a playoff team, but I thought they could be closer to Orlando and Indiana than a 15 game win gap that we're seeing this year. And Mikel Bridges has not proven to be a number one. And the, the Nets had an offer on the table, apparently, where it was multiple first-round picks and Jalen Green for Mikel Bridges um, in the beginning of the year. And they turned that down. And in hindsight, they'd probably like to redo that because they don't own their first-round picks. So uh, Mikel Bridges leading this team as a one where they could have hoped where they could have been around 500. Mikel Bridges replicates the numbers last year, is right up there in the most improved player conversation. None of that really happened. And now Mikel Bridges is not going to go for maybe a King's Ransom in the offseason if he were to get traded. Um, you think he could go for Jalen Green in four first-round picks? Yes, originally, but now he may go for like a good player in like two first-round picks. I don't know. Um, I don't think Brooklyn is in any rush to move him because they don't own any of their picks. I don't think he's going to request a trade out. That doesn't seem like his personality to do so. And he's under contract, $23 million next year and 25 million about in 2026. An incredible contract. Like I will still pay that for Bridges because he's a really good number two or number three. And he's still an also very good defender. So like, it goes back to what I said in the beginning of the pod where I was like, um, it's not because these guys are having bad years. I think Jordan Poole is having a relatively bad season, but I think McCub Bridges is having a fine season, but we thought we would see him take that leap. We thought we could see him take that leap into being a fringe number one. Maybe what we've seen from Tyrese Maxey this year in Philadelphia, and we just did not see that from McCub Bridges, and that's why I think he should land in this disappointing list. And if you wanted to pick another net, that's fine with me. I think Cam Johnson is very disappointing, fresh off that new contract extension. Maybe Nick Claxton in the contract year. Hell, we, yeah, like I said with Ben Simmons, we we got bamboozled once again and he got hurt and he's out for the year so the nets this year overall have just been super disappointing as a team and i think mikhail bridges headlines that and he's my second guy i wanted to mention all right next up i wanted to talk about a rookie and i'm going to talk about scoot henderson now i think scoot henderson comes with a little bit more leeway than everybody else mentioned here because he's a rookie and i'm not going to clown on scoot henderson i'm not going to hate on him because i was a super big fan of Scoot Henderson coming at the G League Ignite. I was adamant. I was fine with it, but I was saying that, you know what? He should go number two, pair him up with Lamella Ball. You figure it out. We saw it kind of work out in Sacramento with Halliburton and Fox, or at least they were able to move Halliburton for some bonus down the line, which worked out. That could happen. Yeah, it's a good problem, right? But it looks like Charlotte made the right decision, taking Brandon Miller 100%. And Scoot, I don't know if it's the situation. I don't know if I want to blame this all on Chauncey Billups this year, but I think I have to at least blame some of it on Scoot Henderson. I was kind of going to his numbers before I made this uh, or started recording this, and he has 11 games this year shooting 50 plus percent from the field, 11 of them. And two of those, he played seven minutes and six minutes. So it's really kind of nine. He has 13 games this year shooting under 30%. That's not even counting the mid 30%, the low 40%, and the um, low 30% games he's had. 13 games. He's got more games shooting under 30% from the field than above um, 50%, which, you know what? He's a rookie guard. This is happening. This Or this happens all the time to rookie guards. They're usually pretty inefficient. We've seen that with like guys like De'Aaron Fox in the past. We've seen that before with even like highly drafted uh highly drafted guards so um i think scoot henderson will be fine i am far from giving up on him he's freaking 19 years old there is no reason to give up on him or he just turned 20 so there's no reason to give up on him by any means i just think i expected a little bit more i think scoot should probably not make an all-rookie team which is crazy and that's disappointing because i thought he could have given maybe even Wemby a run for his money in the rookie of the year race we thought that maybe scoot would be where brandon miller is in that combo right now and he has been one of the worst rookies with the amount of playing time he's had. 27 minutes a night. He's taking around 12 shots a night, shooting 37% from the field, 30% from three, 82% from the line, which is encouraging. Five assists a night, 13 points. Now, I think next year, Scoot will be better. I just thought he would be a little bit better in his rookie season, and that's why I wanted to talk about it. I think I could see that 37% field goal percentage to go up into the low 40s. We could see that 30, 31% three-point efficiency to go up into the low to mid 30s. If we see that like 34 percent 33 percent that's realistic and that's very encouraging because he's a good free throw shooter so and i think the form is there he'll eventually get down 
and be a good enough outside shooter. Um, five assists a night, 13 points. We'll see him as the full-time point guard uh, next year. I know we've seen plenty of Malcolm Brogdon and Anthony Simons, and he's only started less than like half his games. He started 23 to the 53, and I think Chauncey Billups has not done a great job with him this year. He's had his fair share of injuries as well, so he's been banged up. So I think that's like so many different factors for Scoot. Coaching, playing time, injuries, um, just the rookie inefficiency thing with guards that usually happens. Um, my disappointment is just, I thought Scoot would be a little bit better in his rookie year. And that's on me. That's for me having high expectations for Scoot. That's why I wanted to mention that this is pretty subjective. And you think overall, Matt, he's a rookie. Like he's fine. I agree. I think he's going to be fine still. I just think that this year is rookie year. Um, he's been a little bit disappointing and it's going to be kind of disappointing that I don't think he should really make an all rookie team. I think Keontae George has been better than him, which is kind of wild like a man thompson in his short playing time at least with his defensive ability this year probably has been better than scoot henderson um so yeah i maybe scoot probably makes all rookie second team i mean we'll see we'll see but it has not been pretty some nights for scoot henderson and the portland trailblazers this year that have been kind of a dumpster fire um not a dumpster fire now i shouldn't say that because that was kind of the detroit pistons for a while um and the, the blazers haven't been that bad um but yeah they got to figure out this core and i think they got to get a new head coach next year but yeah scoot's making the list all right next up we got a Golden State Warrior. Now, you could have a few Golden State Warriors. Um, Kavon Mooney could definitely make this list for sure, but I didn't really have too high of expectations for Kavon Mooney. I know he was pretty good in the playoffs last year, but I wanted to talk about Andrew Wiggins. Now, Andrew Wiggins has been playing uh, somewhat better as of late, and I know he's had um, off-the-court issues. Like, I'm not going to go into that, and if there's a reason, like, that's more important than basketball. So I'm not here to, like, dunk or clown on Andrew Wiggins at all by any means. And he's been good over his last 10-ish games. So I hope he's trending in the right direction. There's it was even a stretch before those 10 games as well from kind of like beginning of February to um, the end of February where he averaged a decent amount of points a night. It was around 15 a night, um, good efficiency uh, and was hitting the three point shot, which you'd like to see. And then maybe next year he can be like fully acclimated again into the kind of the basketball side of things for the Warriors. But 62 games this year, it's it's been disappointing for Wiggins because like Jordan Poole that I mentioned before, that 2022 season was so special for Andrew Wiggins and the Warriors. And I don't know how the Warriors did that in 22. Like Clay coming back healthy, you're getting an elite pool for them, an elite Andrew Wiggins, Draymond at a level, Curry at a level, injuries didn't really happen. They got a healthy Otto Porter for that season. That's like insane. And that season was like blessed for Warriors and Warriors fans. But you're seeing him average 12 points per game this year, four and a half rebounds, one and a half assists, all noticeably down from last year. He's gone from 47% from the field to 45% from the field, 39% from three to 35% from three. And I, I don't know, man. The free throw percentage hasn't really gone too... I mean, it's improved, but he's still shooting 73% from the stripe. And I don't know if the defense is all that. I mean, you Warriors fans can let me know. Like, I feel like when I'm watching Wiggins, I'm not really getting blown away. And I don't know... It, from last year, it's possibly even taking a step back or it's still kind of influx at times. And obviously playing with Draymond Green helps and Draymond Green's been inconsistently out of the rotation for multi, uh, multiple reasons um, this year. But I think Wiggins has been disappointing 100%. And when you look at the contract um, as well, it's not great, kind of like Jordan Poole's uh, 24 mil this year, 26 mil next year, $28 million in 2026, and then has a $30 million player option in 2027. And when he signed that extension as well in October of 22, fresh off the chip, we thought that's all he signed for. That's kind of a steal. And now it's looking like, yeah, maybe the Warriors... Um, didn't get a steal out of it, um, and it may be an overpay, but I think this could be just chalk it up as a down year for Wiggins, but the Warriors team is in a really weird situation. I don't know if they could even move him in the offseason. Obviously, like the emergence of Kuminga, that's going to be a big highlight point and focal point next year, um, and you can even, I'm not going to say you could mention Steph Curry for this video, um, but there, there was a point where Steph Curry could carry this Warriors team, no matter how bad it seemed like, and this year, it seems like I, I mean, he's 35, so I'm not going to say that he's going to be able to carry them still, but it doesn't seem like it's that old Steph Curry that we used to see. I mean, they're a game above the Rockets for the 10th spot. One game. They could be the 11th seed and miss out on the playing tournament entirely. They could be this year's Dallas Mavericks from last year, which would be very disappointing as a whole. So yeah, I wanted to mention Andrew Wiggins in here. Um, I mean, we kind of saw it at times last year with disappointment, and he was obviously like had his personal reasons why he wasn't playing. And this year, um, it's been disappointment, and and he's gonna play almost 70 games. Like that's a pretty solid sample size from this year where he's been bad. Like I said, though, been somewhat better as of late. Had a good game the other night, um, or excuse me, last night against Miami as well. Um, and there's been stretches, but there's there are inconsistencies at time too. And he was bad for the first half of the year, so he's gonna make this list one of my most disappointing players. All right, next up, I want to talk about Mark. 
Markel Fultz of the Orlando Magic. Uh, Fultz, yeah, um, I guess we're back to like pre-Orlando Magic Fultz this year. The confidence is kind of gone, man. It really is, it seems like. The confidence on the offensive end, I don't think the defense has really taken that much of a step, and I don't think he's that much of an impact guy to this Magic good defensive team this year like i think that goes to jalen suggs that goes to jonathan isaac um that can go to mo wagner that can go to paulo bancaro at times um but i don't think that can go to markel Fultz, who has gone from 14 points tonight to seven and a half points tonight six assists tonight to three assists tonight um the field goal percentage is from 51 percent to 47 percent. he is non-existent from three he took at least a three and a half per game last year at 31 percent. that's fine at least take him this year he's not really taking any threes no he's not at all uh he's played in just 33 games uh he started in just 15 of them and with the emergence of jalen suggs with at least the consistency the consistent play of cole anthony I don't know what it's going to be looking like for Fultz. Like, well, um, their last game that he played in on the 23rd, uh, it's just like four points, two assists, and 19 minutes. Um, he is a free agent at the end of the year. I know people, including me, thought he could have not a breakout year, but a really good year, a really good contract year, because we saw the flashes last year. We saw the improvement in the jump shot in the offensive game, and it's taken a step back, unfortunately. $17 million contract this year, unrestricted free agent. I'm surprised he didn't get moved at the deadline. Maybe nobody wanted him. I don't know why Brooklyn, Toronto, it's an expiring. You didn't want to at least take a chance on Marco Fultz. You wanted at least um, Spencer Dinwiddie to wave. I mean, Fultz at least has a little bit more upside. But yeah, like San Antonio, you didn't want Fultz. I don't know. I'm intrigued to see where Fultz ends up. Like he's still good enough to make a roster spot next year. But like seeing the improvement in each and every year, it seemed like in Orlando, uh, besides that 22 season where he was uh, kind of banged up. Um, and even like the 21 season, well, he was banged up 21 and 22, most of it. Like we saw that improvement first year in Orlando, back-to-back -back banged up seasons. We saw 60 games from him last year. And the man, I, oh, it's kind of sucks that we're back to square one with Marco Fultz. Cause I really thought this would be the year where he can average maybe 17 points and seven assists and be like the third most important offensive player for this magic team. And it's just not been the case. And obviously they're fine with that with Jalen Suggs always taking that jump and they have Anthony Black in the wings um, waiting. But yeah, Marco Fultz has to be, in my opinion, one of the more disappointing players of the season because a lot of us thought he was going to take that jump this year and he just didn't. So yeah, Marco Fultz is making this list. All right, next up we got... <laughs> I hate that this is a nickname on basketball reference, but this the slob wizard. Uh, we're going to talk about Josh Giddy. So obviously the season did not start all that well with Josh Giddy um, with the whole um, minor incident. You guys already know about it. I'm not going to go into it. We're going to look at it just pure basketball play this year. And somebody that came off a really good season last year and how good he played in those games leading up to the play-in and the play-in itself. He finished last year with 16 and a half points, eight rebounds, and six assists tonight on good efficiency. 48% from the field. 33% from three, you'll take, um, and 73% from the line, which maybe as a whole, like if you look at the bigger picture, um, or if you look at that just on um, the surface value, maybe not great efficiency, but for Giddy's improvement from what he did um, before the draft to his rookie season to uh, the sophomore year, those are the jumps you wanted to see 100%. And man, this year, it's it's been weird. I mean, he's been playing better as of late, um, but his points have dropped. Obviously, you're adding Chet Holmgren into the mix, but he's gone from 16 and a half points to 11.8 points. His assists have dropped by assists and a half a night, pretty much. Rebounds have dropped by a rebound and a half a night. Field goal percentage is down. Three-point percentage is up, which is encouraging, and so is the free throw percentage, which are encouraging signs for Giddy that his shot can be a little bit more efficient. And like I said, he has been playing better as of late, so I'm not going to say that he's been like a, like a complete negative this year. Like he was in the first half of the year where he was not a good defender. His playmaking wasn't there. His offensive game was kind of horrible, some really dumb turnovers. But over his last 11 games, he's averaging 15 points, five assists, seven rebounds and shooting 56 from the field and 42 from three um and hasn't missed the free throw as well in those games so i want to give credit to giddy um but that i think sample size we thought we could see over 82 games this year and we did not see that and he was very disappointing in the first half of the year obviously like i mentioned the off the court issues too like what was going on with that it seems like that's kind of not been mentioned as much anymore and maybe it's all kind of resolved but it, it sucks to see giddy that we thought could take that big step in 20 um in his age 21 season and we've seen that from Jalen Williams we've seen that from Shea we've seen an incredible rookie season from Chet but it seems like we we saw a decent amount of steps back from Josh Giddy, and it's going to be a big year four I doubt he gets that um rookie extension I doubt it unless he wants to 
I don't know, but does Giddy think he's gonna get more money next year? I mean, if he has another mediocre year, then he could probably kiss a long-term contract goodbye and then has to do a one-year prove-it deal somewhere else. But I think Giddy has a chance to get traded in this offseason. And I think if San Antonio would be interested, Giddy's value is definitely a lot lower than it was last year. And they could probably give up the assets to go out and get Giddy to be a playmaker for Wemby. And that could be somewhat of a good idea if everything's all right with Giddy. But yeah, I would say Giddy's been disappointing this year because we thought he was going to take that year three jump that we've seen from like Kuminga, we've seen from Shangun, we've seen from Scotty Barnes. Um, and I don't have anybody else from this 21 draft class, but you could also talk about Evan Mobley. I have a cab we'll get to later on. Um, but Evan Mobley, I think with his injuries in the 21 class, you could definitely have Jalen Green might make the list of the Rockets' most disappointing player this year. I know he's been very good over his last like 20 games, but he was really bad from like October to February, October to January. So I don't know if he's going to make it. That's where I think I'm going to get like flamed if I throw that like Rockets fans are going to come at me just because the last like 15 games have been really good for Green uh, even though he was so inconsistent to start off the year um, but yeah I'm going to like we'll get into that in that video you guys can let me know in the YouTube comments what do you think about Jalen Green um, but yeah Josh Giddy making this list thought we would see a bigger year three jump next up we got Crumble Cookie himself Tobias Harris now um, Harris came into the year could have been a number two um, after the Harding deal but we all knew that was kind of be Tyrese Maxey and it feels like Tobias Harris um, I don't know, man. Like, he's been consistent, and the points per game are up this year, obviously, because we've seen his volume go up without Joel Embiid. He's taken two, almost three more shots a night. Um, and the efficiency, like, the three-point shot is not there. It's gone down from 39% last year to 33% this year. I feel like he doesn't hustle all that much back on defense, and if it, even if he is trying to hustle, he's not very fast or very athletic to keep up with some of these other quicker forwards that he has to guard. I feel like it's a lot of inconsistencies with Tobias Harris tonight where it's like one night like we can even look at his last five games for example Kings game March 25th 33% from the field 12 points game before that on the 24th hey he had 24 points on 58% shooting then the game before that 16 points on 33% shooting game before that against Milwaukee 15 points on 45% shooting game before that two points in 26 minutes and if you look at his just game log this whole year it's constant inconsistencies it's tough to find like there's been some nice stretches, but it seems like he rattles off two, three, even four good games in a row. And then it's back-to-back -back stinkers or it's a stinker every other game. And it, it seems like Tobias Harris never developed that consistency that we maybe thought. In contract year, Tobias Harris, which has been a very big thing for him in his career. Obviously, he played very well before he got that Sixers bag in the 2019 season um in the 2020 season he was very good for them as well um and he's finally done at the end of the year i don't know if Gerald Moore is going to bring him back 39 million dollars is going to be off the books i wonder what team he will be on next year could be a team like detroit could be a team like charlotte could be a team like portland or san antonio or indiana i don't know no definitely not indiana but it could be on a different team um but yeah i think harris has been disappointing this year just as a veteran that i thought could have been a little bit more impactful for the philadelphia 76ers this year even more when joel Embiid got hurt all right, next up, we got a uh, guy that got a new contract last offseason. It was, I believe, was it four for 80? It might have been three for 60. Three for 60, Nikola Vucevic. Yeah, Vuce, man. Uh, he's definitely been surpassed as Kobe White, as I would say the second best Chicago ball. You probably have DeRozan number one, I know. If you watch the Shross channel uh, and you watched my award predictions, I said that Kobe White, I think I, I, I like at times could be the number one better than DeRozan obviously that's not true like overall this year DeRozan's better than Kobe White I just think at times White's been a little bit more impactful than DeRozan and at times I know how good DeRozan's been this year for Chicago especially in the clutch and um like White's number two Levine's been out of the picture Vucevic man it's 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 pretty brutal like he's not the offensive hub he used to be in Orlando um like Sabonis has definitely surpassed him as like one of the better offensive hubs. Obviously, like Jokic is in its own tier. And then you have like your Sabonis's of the world. Like you had your Shangoons this year of like these post guys that can either score inside, work the dribble handoff, or be pretty solid facilitators. And we've seen good passing seasons from Vucevic. Like we saw high threes per game. And I thought there was one point in his career where he could average four and a half to five assists a night and take a jump like that. I mean, he had a really good 2019 season for Orlando, I thought, after that. Or even the season, um, his all-star season in 21, but then he got traded to Chicago. And it's not really been much better. Like, this year, his points have technically gone up from 17.6 to 18 a night. But the efficiency... It's, it's pretty brutal, man. 52% uh, from the field to 48% from the field, 34% from three to 28% from three on the same amount of attempts a night. Four attempts a night 
pretty brutal from outside. Uh, the free throw percentage is fine. The rebounds have gone down. I think there's definitely a loss uh, uh, athleticism from Nikola Vucevic, and he's not maybe, I don't think he was ever an elite rim protecting defender, um, or at least just like an elite defender overall, but it's not pretty watching him anchor that defense, which is a shame because they have some really good defensive playmakers on that team. Uh, like at times with Patrick Williams and obviously one of the best defenders who will be on an all defensive team, most likely in Alex Caruso, like a lot of potential for that Bulls defense if it was anchored by somebody that was more impressive on that end of the floor. Um, but I think Vucevic, especially off that contract extension, how much he's making a year, $20 million, 33 years old, going to be there for the next two years, most likely. Unless you're like, Golden State, let's do Vucevic for Wiggins. But why would you want that? Wiggins is making more money. And he's even in this video and pod that I'm talking about now. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't know what Chicago is going to do with Vucevic. I don't know if there's even a better center alternative out there. If there's a way that they could be like, we want Nick Claxton. We'll pay Nick Claxton. And Brooklyn takes Vucevic. I mean, Brooklyn may have no other choice. They may have no other choice to do that. Like, I'm just saying, like, that's, I'm trying to think, like, in my mind, how you can upgrade from Vucevic next year. But I think, like, for somebody that also, like, when I mentioned Tobias Harris, not taking that step with him beat out, I don't think Vucevic has really capitalized on being a higher volume scorer with Zach Levine out this year. We just haven't seen that. And obviously, it's been fine for Chicago, at least because Kobe Woody's taking that jump. But yeah, nonetheless, has been pretty disappointing this year for, um, for Nicole Vucevic, as they are 34 and 38. I mean, they were pretty bad to start off the year. Like, at least that team has come around a little bit. And they're going to be in the playing tournament um, because Brooklyn has just fallen off a cliff. Um, but yeah, so Vucevic is making this list. We got two more guys to talk about, both their guards. All right, next up, it is a second year, man. I talked about a rookie, Scoot Henderson, before. I want to talk about Jaden Ivey. And I think, like when I talked about Scoot Henderson, blaming some of it on Chauncey Billups, I could definitely definitely blame some of the disappointments of Jaden Ivey on Monty Williams. An absolute mess for the Pistons this year. They were on pace to being one of the worst teams of all time up there with like that 2012 Bobcats team, that 2010 New Jersey Nets team. It was bad. Um, they still have the worst record in the league because the Wizards have won some games. They are 12 and 60. Oh my God, that is so gross. Um, 12 and 60 right now. I don't know if they hit 15 wins. I don't know if they hit 15 wins. It's been a bad year for Detroit. Um, the worst team in the league. And Ivy doesn't really look like he's taken a step. And it's fine if he's going to be pretty stagnant this year. We saw that from like Scotty Barnes last year. And people were down on Barnes. It's fine. Your three jumps happen all the time. Sophomore slumps are a real thing. And there was some encouragement from Jaden Ivy in his rookie season. Um, but I think this year, the efficiency... It's it's not improved, really. And I know that his playing time, like what was going on with Jaden Ivey's playing time in the beginning of the year? What was Monty Williams doing? Like it was so stagnant. It was so inconsistent. And that's not how you develop a 20-year-old guard in year two. Like we were all pissed about that. And his numbers have gone down pretty much when you can think like his numbers should be going up. I know Kate is back and he was without Kate his rookie year, but his numbers have gone down 16 points to 15 points, 5.2 assists last year. I think that's been a big thing. The playmaking has kind of gone down three and a half assists this year, four rebounds to three and a half rebounds. His field goal percentage is 42% to 43% this year, but the three point percentage, 34% to 32%. 74% of the line to 76% this year. It's been an up and down year for Jaden Ivey. I think there are defensive flashes for sure, but then at times there's just none. And I think the outside jumper, the mid-range jumper was going to be a big thing with him. And we saw that in the second half of last year's season. And we just haven't really seen that at all in year two. There have been stretches. There was that one stretch, I believe it was in February, um, where Jaden Ivey showed that encouragement that he could be like a legit number two for this team going forward. Um, I'll, I'll just pull up like a random sample size from January 15th to February 10th. Over 13 games, he averaged 21 points, four and a half assists, four and a half rebounds, 48, 51, 67 splits. That's encouragement. That is freaking encouragement. I don't know what happened to that Jaden Ivey. Um, he was playing a ton. He's still been playing a ton now. There's some games where it's under 30 minutes a night and they made the trades at the deadline. I don't know. Uh, it's been a Bad year coaching for Monty Williams. I think it's been a disappointing year two for Jaden Ivey thinking like, because I was so high on him. He was my number two player in that 2022 draft class. So I got to say, I've been disappointed. And the last guy I want to talk about is Darius Garland. Yeah, probably the best player mentioned in this video. I mean, him and definitely Mikel Bridges. I think Garland goes back into that case. Now he's had his injuries this year. He had the jaw injuries, had a couple other injuries as well. So injuries could play a part in this. And he's still just 24 years old. Um, or yeah, he still he just turned 24 from that 2019 draft class. But you think Garland, after the year he had last year, and I know it was inconsistent for him in the playoffs, we thought that he could really take a jump 
to in that next tier of point guards. Now, I don't know if you would ever have like a John Morant type stat line just because of the scoring that Donovan Mitchell is going to provide for you. So it's tough to see two 27 point per game cards when you have other guys that get, need to be fed the ball as well. But seeing Garland's numbers kind of drop across the board and his confidence, like, I don't know what happened to his confidence this year, but it seems like it's kind of off. Um, 21 points a night to 18 points a night this year. Eight assists a night last year to six. Like, that should at least stay the same. Um, with the Like, if the scoring is going to go down, that should at least stay the same at the minimum. The efficiency is down. 46 from the field to 45%. 41 from three to 36% from three, which is still good. But, like, Garland was teetering, like, becoming fringe top five point guard. Like, fringe, right? But now... I don't think he's in that conversation. Now, there's been good stretches, like for sure. Like we've seen like a 10-game stretch basically from um, the end of February to the middle of March where he averaged 23 points and seven assists on really good efficiency. But then it's back down to the inconsistent play where it's like we're getting like these random 38%. Like over his last, what, seven games, 38% from the field, 27%, 38%, 38%, 44%, 50%. Uh, like that's over six games. I don't know. It's just been kind of inconsistent for Garland. Like I said, I don't think the defense has taken any improvement. I don't think he's taken a step. Like his confidence just seems like it isn't there, which is a shame because Garland is still a good player. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying he's a bad player. That's not what this video means. I just think that Garland could have taken a big step in this year, in year number five. And I know injuries have hindered that, but um I mean, injuries or not it's been disappointing for Darius Garland this year 100 percent all right and I want to finish this out with my March Madness predictions here for the Sweet 16 um we have games on Thursday the next episode of the pod will be on Friday so you'll know the outcome of these games um and then I guess on Friday's pod I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it out at a certain time so I'm just going to predict all the Sweet 16 games we got Alabama North Carolina um I was I've been high on UNC, but I think like this has been a pretty easy path for the Tar Heels. I don't love them as like a one seed, and I think they could definitely lose to Arizona 100%. Um, But I think UNC will beat Alabama. Their defense isn't good. They played Grand Canyon and Charleston so far, so it's going to be a little bit of a wake up for Bama here um, against the Tar Heels. So I do think that UNC ends up beating them. Uh, Clemson, Arizona. I mean, a lot of people were on the Lobos, including me in New Mexico to beat Clemson. Clemson beats them. And then Clemson beats Baylor. That was the biggest upset pretty much from the round of 32. Um, And they're going to go up against Arizona. I still like Arizona to beat them. I'm going to try to not pick every favorite here, but I'm going to pick Arizona to beat Clemson. I'm going to obviously pick UConn to beat the Aztecs um, in San Diego State. UConn, I mean, mowed down Stetson. They mowed down Northwestern. I think they could beat San Diego State. I mean, this is pretty cool because it's a rematch of last year's national championship game. Um, but yeah, UConn is too good. Um, this could be their closest game, sure. But, but I, I think UConn is going to make another quick work of the Aztecs and then it gets more serious for them in the Elite Eight. And as much as I want to like Danny Hurley, I do because he's an offensive genius or he's like just a coaching wizard for UConn and what he's done for this team since he's become the head coach. Why does he complain a lot? He's so like smart and he, he, he seems like a could be a badass at times, and he's built up such a good program at UConn. Like, he was complaining that he was like, oh, I know what the committee's doing to me. Like, they're giving us these really tough teams, like FAU and Northwestern as an 8-9. Are you kidding me? I'm like, what? Well, you could have gotten a and in round two, which is a much tougher matchup. Like, FAU, nobody really thought should have, some people even thought shouldn't even have made the tournament. Um, and Northwestern, you're complaining about that? Like, San Diego State in the Sweet 16... I don't know, man. I don't know. I feel like Danny Hurley's been complaining a little bit. And I mean, like the two seed, like Iowa State, I'd rather go up against Iowa State than most of these other two seeds. I'd rather play Iowa State, in my opinion, than Marquette, than Arizona. Um, Like Creighton's not a two seed, but Creighton, or excuse me, Tennessee, Creighton. I think UConn made out pretty well with their region for sure. Might be the weakest region. Um, Illinois, Iowa State. I'm going to take Illinois in this one. Uh, Terrence Shannon's been an absolute beast as of late. Um, They won the Big Ten tournament. They have some momentum. I know that uh, Iowa State won the Big 12 tournament. Iowa State won the Big 12 tournament, right? Yeah. Um, But I think an upset's got to happen here, right? I can't take every favorite. So it's really just that. It's madness. And I I need Iowa State for my brackets. So maybe I'm going to do some reverse psychology here so that could really work out. Um, And then Friday's games, we got NC State Marquette. As much as I want to take... Um, DJ Burns and just kind of like that story of NC State and them winning the ACC, running the table, and they've been such a Cinderella story. I think it ends against Marquette, but man, if they beat Marquette, hell yeah, I'm all on NC State. Let's get them in the title game. Uh, Gonzaga Purdue. Oh man, I I kind of like Gonzaga. I'm gonna take Gonzaga. I think we could see some major upsets. I think this is where we could see Gonzaga beat Purdue. I do. They've been good. They've been good, and I think Duke beats Houston. 
Duke's offense looks so good against JMU. I think Duke can replicate somewhat of AM did, but actually execute and beat Houston, who looks a little vulnerable after that AM game. And then Creighton, Tennessee. Screw it. We got Creighton. I got Creighton winning, man. Let's do this. Let's do this. I've actually, I like Creighton more than Tennessee, and I've had them advancing past Tennessee in all my brackets. Um, I, I think Creighton's really good, and they could be a Final Four team. So, hell, I said no upsets. I got pretty much two one seeds going down and a two seed going down. Those are my predictions there for Sweet 16. I'm really excited. And then we get the Elite Eight on Saturday, which is kind of a, like, no pun intended, but elite. Like, let's freaking go. We're going to get Elite Eight play um, this weekend. I'm very excited. And I hope you guys did enjoy this episode of the Just Ball on Podcast. Let me know if you're on YouTube in the comments what you agree with or disagree with with any of these disappointing players or my March Madness Sweet 16 predictions. And then if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, could really appreciate a rating and review. It goes a long way to help grow the pod. Appreciate that a ton. I love you guys. And I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.